Coming to metabolic syndrome, what exactly is metabolic syndrome? Metabolic syndrome is obesity associated with dyslipidemia, hypertension, and type 2 diabetes. So what is the diagnostic criteria? So we only diagnose, the, diagnose children more than 10 years of age. It is defined as central obesity based on the waist circumference plus any two of the four. They can have raised triglycerides, reduced HDL, increased uh, hyper, that is hypertension or increased blood pressure, and type 1, type 2 diabetes. So any of this, uh, if, if there is two of the four factors with obesity, they are said to have metabolic syndrome. Hypertension, as I mentioned, is also a cardiovascular risk factor. PCOD is very common now among adolescent girls, resulting in uh, irregular menstrual cycles. They present with hirsutism or increased hair growth over the face and weight gain. And that is also secondary to insulin resistance and lifestyle changes. NAFLD also, as I mentioned, it aggravates the insulin resistance. And even if you have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it can increase the risk of you getting type 2 diabetes. So how do you diagnose NAFLD? We do a serum ALT or alanine transferase. And if it's more than 25 in boys and more than 22 in girls, it is diagnosed. So now how do you evaluate an obese child? So suppose a child comes, you have to take a history. So based on the onset, as I mentioned, if it is during infancy, it is more likely to be a genetic cause. If it is during childhood or puberty, it could be either of the two. And we need to find out the duration. Is it a very rapid weight gain? That could be more in favor of pathological causes. What is the antenatal history? That, as I mentioned, antenatal risk factors can also result in obesity. Was it a IUGR baby or SGA baby? Is there a developmental delay that goes more in favor of genetic causes? Is there a family history of obesity or metabolic syndrome? And how is the general behavior and environment? What is the activity? What does the child eat? How much is the duration of TV viewing? And diet history is very important. We have to take a 24-hour dietary recall. Most parents refuse. The one issue that you find in the clinic is most parents refuse to admit that their child is overweight or obese. And secondly, they do not give a proper diet history. So you need to sit down with them and exactly make out what exactly is the issue and find a uh, solution to that. So as I mentioned, if there is mental retardation goes more in favor of genetic, if there is short stature or decreased height velocity over six months to one year, it goes more in favor of an endocrine cause. Any medication news we should ask and based on, we need to find out what is the complications of the obesity that the child is having. Is the child having any snoring or morning headaches? It goes in favor of obstructive sleep apnea or any knee or hip pain, any polyuria, polydipsia goes in favor of type 2 diabetes, any irregular menses or hirsutism goes in favor of PCOS. And now what do you examine in a child with obesity? First, as I mentioned, BMI, because that's how you diagnose obesity, waist to hip ratio more than seven, uh, as I mentioned, more than 0.95 and more than 0.85, and also waist circumference more than the 70th centile. We have to check the vitals, especially blood pressure is very important. If the child is already hypertensive, we have to be managed with antihypertensives or lifestyle measures based on the BP reading. Then we need to come to the head to toe examination. This gives us a very big clue as to what is the complications and what is the cause of obesity also. If it is exogenous, there might not be any such, uh, uh, the child might be completely normal head to toe examination except for complications. But if it is a pathological cause, then there can be dysmorphic features, cushion word features such as uh, buffalo humps, moon faces. If there is infantile faces, that is characteristic of growth hormone deficiency. If there is any cleft lip, cleft palate, that is also characteristic of growth hormone deficiency. Eyes, we look at papilledema for pseudotumor cerebri. Neck, you look at goiter if there is any hypothyroidism. Then chest, you can look for gynecomastia or lipomastia. And skin, you look for dry skin for hypothyroidism, striae for Cushing, hirsutism and acne for PCOD. And acanthosis nigricans is a clear-cut marker for insulin resistance. So where all do you look for acanthosis? You look at the nape of the neck, you look at the groin, and you look at the axilla. So it's basically velvety, dark, uh, dry, uh, thickened skin because of insulin resistance. And uh, very rare causes is our pseudo-hypoparathyroidism. Uh, uh, pseudo if there is shortening of the fourth and fifth metacarpal, that is characteristic of pseudo-hypoparathyroidism. Straightening of the ulna border is seen in syndromic causes, that is Tadaville syndrome. 
and we should also look for undescended testis and micropenis that is characteristic of growth hormone or multiple pituitary hormone deficiency hypogonadism can also be seen in genetic causes that is our prader willi bardet fetal etc so apart from bmi as i mentioned we'll also what are the methods of estimating the body fat the waist circumference waist hip ratio is very easily done we can also do the skin fold thickness hydro densitometry ultrasound bioelectrical impedance but the gold standard is dexa scan to estimate what is the body fat composition so what investigations will you do if a child comes with overweight obesity routinely we can do our cbc lft rft look for non alcoholic liver disease etc if the child is having insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes we can do an oral glucose tolerance test Uh, we should look for dyslipidemia so we require a fasting lipid levels we also require a hba1c and fasting blood glucose hgpt for non alcoholic fatty liver disease if the child has having symptoms of pcos then child requires serum lh fsh basically are pubertal hormones and testosterone estimation ultrasound is not uh, involved in the diagnostic criteria for adolescents but it can still be done for completion basis If there is fetus of pseudo tumor cerebri, then might require require a CT or an MRI brain. Musculoskeletal problems will require X-ray and an ortho consult. If there is obstructive sleep apnea, we have to do a sleep study or polysomnography. So to know of the cause of obesity, so exogenous obesity can be clearly made out based on their uh, behavioral, uh, environmental, and dietary history. So if we know that the child has been eating a lot of junk food, a lot of processed food. has been not exercising has been watching a lot of tv then we know that is clear cut case of exogenous obesity but if we are suspecting hypothyroidism then we have to get a pre t4 and tsh level if we are suspecting cushing syndrome we have to get a urinary free cortisol serum cortisol and if those are characteristic we have to go ahead with a dexamethasone suppression test if we are suspecting growth hormone deficiency we have to get a growth hormone stimulation test and igf1 level if it's suspecting a genetic syndrome because of early onset of obesity child is having dysmorphic facies child is having hyperphagia then we need to go for a genetic testing any cns disorder hypothalamic a tumor or trauma or anything like that we have to go for an mri brain if it's strongly suspecting a genetic then we go for gene testing and we can also do leptin levels to diagnose leptin deficiency so <clears throat> prevention of obesity is the key and how do you prevent so the main prevention is eat smart play smart and make smart choices so nutritional education is very important and all meals should be had as a family and we should stop avoiding to give food as rewards limit any junk processed packaged food and encourage nutritional labeling and reading of food labels provide an individual meal program proper behavioral therapy proper glucose setting cognitive restructuring reduction of stress in schools and in tuitions and policy making so these are all the need of the hour prevention is the best if not possible then we'll have to go for treatment and management so how do you manage as i mentioned prevention is best but okay the child has become overweight and obese how do you manage and this i'm mainly talking about exogenous obesity so the cardinal rule is 5 to 1 and 0 so you need to have at least encourage the child to have at least five fruits and vegetables a day 2 hours or less of screen time 1 hour or more of physical activity and zero sugary drinks and so how do we manage the main management is diet modification and behavioral therapy family based programs then we also have to talk to them about physical activity the last after diet and um, behavioral therapy even after 3 to 6 months the child has not lost weight the child's bmi has not reduced then we'll have to go to stage 2 which is pharmacotherapy and stage 3 which is bariatric surgery so i'll just talk to you in brief about how do you manage an adolescent or an uh, child with overweight obesity so what are the diet strategies that you will use you have to maintain a normal balanced meal with carbohydrates of 50 to 55 protein of 15 to 20 and fat intake of less than 25% and the fat should have less of saturated fat and more of polyunsaturated fatty acids plenty of liquids plenty of fibers and micronutrients give frequent meals avoid large meals with long gaps and at least as i mentioned 5 to 1 0 rule minimize the beverages sugar sweetened beverages prepare more meals at home avoid ordering from outside 
and eat as a family at least a five to six times in a week. If you eat as a family, it is known that children are more likely to eat their fruits and vegetables and eat less of the junk food. Allow the child to eat his own own meal. Don't try to force it upon the child and avoid overly restrictive feeding behavior. So this is the traffic light food guide. As you can see, any food item which is in green, which are the common fruit groups, which are our fruits and vegetables, lean meats, eggs, nuts, whole grain bread, cereals, rice, water, milk, all of them can be eaten as much as required because they're rich in nutrients. The ones which are in orange should be a little, you should go a little easy on them, eat them in moderation, which include our processed meat, fat and dairy items and fruit juices, milks, cakes, biscuits, etc. The ones in red, you need to really think, is it required? Should I eat very, very, uh, not very often, very rarely it should be eaten. Those are our deep fried food, <clears throat> processed meat, desserts, cakes, muffins, sweet items, chocolates, etc. So this is the so if uh, you can uh, decide what uh, what method you want to advise dietary, you can go for the five two one zero rule. You can tell in brief about the traffic food light system. But what I've seen most uh, which works most well, especially in the initial when they've come at the initial stage, is the plate method. So when you have uh, you have to take a moderate size plate. What is the plate method? So you take a moderate size plate and you have to divide it into three portions. And one half of the portion should be full of fruits and vegetables, which is 50%. The rest 25% should be protein rich food, which could be our chicken, our egg, chana, dal, uh, any kind of paneer, any kind of protein which you usually incorporate in the food. And the other quarter alone should be carbohydrates. So we should limit our rice intake to only one quarter. And even if it's whatever carbohydrates, it should be only one quarter. And that will help in increasing our intake of di uh, fruits and vegetables as well. So uh, this is a patient of mine who was diagnosed with uh, exogenous obesity with a BMI of 28. So which is definitely in the obesity range. And as I can make us, I, I basically taught him the plate method. And as you can see, he has uh, given us the, uh, shown us the photos of day-to-day -day plate. So as you can see, at least half of the plate is filled with fruits and vegetables. And there is definitely a protein intake in the form of either egg or there is chicken or there is paneer. And there, uh, the remaining alone is carbohydrates. So this is an example which you can show to your uh, children as well in helping them. Uh, for dietary and nutritional management. So coming to exercise, we have to encourage exercise at least for 30 minutes, five days in a week. Initially start off with 30 minutes, low impact, and then can be increased to one hour high impact. And uh, we need to uh, uh, do a monthly review if necessary for three to six months. This can be dancing, swimming, sports, jogging, cycling, etc. So now, as I mentioned, there is a stepwise management. So first step, which is stage one, we go with the diet strategies, we go with physical activity, we tell them what is the goal. The ideal goal of weight loss should be 0.5 to 1 kg per week if the child is obese. And we should limit the screen time. So we do all these things for a minimum of three months and for a maximum of six months. After there, if there is no improvement, even after three months of stage one, we need to go to stage two, which is a proper structured weight management protocol, where the nutritionist and the pediatric endocrinologist plan every meal uh, with balanced macronutrients, and there is we should completely reduce the quantity of high density food, limit the portion size, monthly uh, follow up, positive reinforcement technique is required. Even after three to six months of stage two, the child refuses or does not uh, follow other to the structured weight management. There is no uh, reduction in the BMI. Then we go to stage three, which is our pharmacotherapy and bariatric surgery. So what, all, what is the pharmacotherapy? What medications can be used for an obese child and what surgery can be done? So coming to pharmacotherapy, there are a very few drugs which have been FDA approved for children with obesity. One such medicine is Orlistat, which is approved only for children more than 12 years and it, uh, it acts by basically inhibiting the liposomal lipases. So it inhibits the gastric and pancreatic lipases and this results in reduction in the fat absorption. But obviously pharmacotherapy comes with side effects. Orlistat basically is known to have oily stools. They can have some gastrointestinal side effects. They can also have vitamin A, D, E and K deficiencies. 
So we need to adequately supplement them. Another medication which is actually sibutramine, this is an SSRI. It is approved for children more than 16 years. We also have a medicine metformin, which you would have heard very widely used in type 2 diabetes. However, metformin is not used for children with obesity unless they are diagnosed to have type 2 diabetes or insulin resistance or children with PCOS, with insulin resistance. So only if an obese child with type 2 or PCOS comes to you, only then you use metformin. Otherwise, you do not use metformin. Uh, how does it work? It reduces the hepatic glucose production, increases the peripheral insulin sensitivity, and decreases the intestinal absorption of glucose. So this is all for exogenous obesity. If it is the other pathological cause, as I mentioned, if it's hypothyroidism, you supplement with thyroxine. If it is a growth hormone deficiency, give growth hormone daily injections. Even Tadaville syndrome, growth hormone is known to improve the body morphology. If it is a hypothalamic obesity, we can give a drug called octreotide. If it is a genetic cause leptin deficiency, we can supplement with leptin. So coming to bariatric surgery, when do we uh, advise bariatric surgery? Even after diet and lifestyle measures, there is no uh, improvement. Even with pharmacotherapy, there is no improvement. And it's an adolescent. It can only be done in adolescents or adults with uh, completion of their puberty and what is the when do we do it we do it when a child or an adolescent bmi is more than 40 or bmi more than 35 with significant comorbidities in the form of type 2 diabetes hypertension dyslipidemia and uh, that as i mentioned extreme obesity there is no difference in the lifestyle modification of pharmacotherapy and the patient should be able to maintain a healthy dietary habit even after the surgery and it should be a stable family who can help the adolescent and there should be an experienced surgeon so i like to end my presentation by just telling you four case based discussions of four spotters which basically, uh, if you just look at the child and look at the spotter, you will be able to make out what is the diagnosis. So the first, as I mentioned, is an infantile. A child came in infancy with early onset obesity. Child had kept wanting to have breast milk, wanting to have teeth. Baby was extremely hungry, hyperphagic. So this is classical of genetic obesity, and this came out to be leptin deficiency. The second uh, is a young boy who presented with dry skin, constipation, lethargy, and not performing well in school. And if you made out his height was just at the third centile, but his weight was at the 75th centile. So this is classical history and the look also classical of hypothyroidism. After levothyroxine supplementation, he got much better. So, uh, photo 3 uh, shows you the classical acanthosis nigricans, which I was mentioning. It is a sign of insulin resistance. So, we usually look at it in the nape of the neck, in the axilla, or in the groin. So, this kind of darkened, velvety, uh, uh, dark thickening of the skin is characteristic of acanthosis. And if any child obese or overweight has acanthosis, they need to be screened for type 2 diabetes with either HbA1c fasting plasma glucose or go ahead with the oral glucose tolerance test. The fourth and the last photo is a child. As you can make out, the fourth and the fifth metacarpal is, this is called as knuckle sign or dimple sign, where you can see the fourth and fifth metacarpal is very small. As a result, this results in dimpling or in that area, and this is characteristic of pseudo-hypoparathyroidism. The child you, you can present with low calcium resulting in tetany and other signs of hypocalcemia such as trovostex sign and cruzor sign. Uh, and they also will present with mild developmental delay. Thank you.